Was the Enoch of Genesis 5, 21 through 24, a character based on someone or something and used by the writer of Genesis 5, 21 through 24 for some purpose he wants the reader of the time to understand? Or did this Enoch first show up in this biblical writing, Genesis 5, 21 through 24? Second one is, if Enoch was unique to Genesis 5, 21 through 24, do you believe he really existed? And then the third one is, if Enoch was a character based on something else, who is it and what do you believe was the purpose slash message? Well, I mean, there are two Enochs in the early chapters of Genesis, and they're distinct people. Uh, there's the Enoch, who's the son of Cain and the father of Irad. That's Genesis 4, 17 and 18. And then there's this one that the, the question is really directed at. Uh, Enoch, the son of uh, Yared, Genesis five eighteen, who's the father of Methuselah, verse 21. I don't think the one in, in chapter five plays off of the one in chapter four. So if, if that's sort of lurking behind the question, that I don't think there's a relationship there. Now, there is, we've talked a little bit about the genealogies, and I've posted some things on the blog before. The, the genealogies of Genesis 5, in which this particular Enoch occurs, uh, the one who lived 365 years, the one who w was taken by God, the one who walked with God, uh, that sort of thing. Th that figure is nestled in with, again, a bunch of these other pre-flood figures and their genealogies are given. They have these long age spans and whatnot. There is a, a striking parallel to the genealogies of Genesis 5 and the long uh, ages from Sumeria. It's known as the Sumerian king list. So in that sense, the Enoch figure occupying position seventh, you know, the seventh from Adam, uh, is going to have a a number seven parallel in that list. And it's true in the Sumerian king list, there, there are some explicit connections by, by virtue of names, you know, with things, you know, people that show up in Genesis 5. So the Sumerian material would predate the Genesis material, you know, by a considerable amount. But I don't know that it, it even if there is some sort of, of you know, borrowings are not really the right term. What I think we have going on here, again, and you'd have to go up to the to the blog, those of you who are listening here. I, I recently, it's been in the last week, posted a an article on uh, by a guy named Lloyd Bailey that that proposes what I think, to this point anyway, that I've seen is the best attempt. Okay, it's not a conclusive kind of piece of work or article, but it's the best attempt I've seen to to make sense of the numbers of the long age spans in Genesis 5 through some mathematical cipher or mathematical pattern or device. Uh, I, I really do think something is going on there uh, because you can do the same thing with the Sumerian king list. And there's this, again, very obvious relationship between these two things. So instead of just sort of borrowing, hey, you know, the, the guy who, you know, we're, we're writing Genesis 5 today, you know, whether you think that's Moses or somebody else. I mean, they're not sitting there thinking like, hey, I need a king list here and I need some genealogies. And, you know, I like math, you know, let's throw some of that in there. Oh, oh, here's one in, in, from Sumeria. I'll borrow this and now I can get to work. And that isn't the point. What I think's going on, again, Genesis 1 through 11, again, it's very Mesopotamian in its flavor in all sorts of ways. It, it, it is a rewriting or a recasting in, in, in a number of cases for polemic purposes, for theological purposes, a, a recasting, a retelling of pre-flood and post-flood events, specifically not from a pagan viewpoint, specifically not from a Mesopotamian religious theologizing of history. It's it's an Israelite, it's a Yahwistic theologizing of history, if you want to, again, for the sake of analogy, that's how I'll talk about it. So in that sense, yeah, there's some relationship to this, but in terms of somebody just sort of liking something they read, and I'm going to borrow that and, and have one of my own, it, there, there's more to it than that. Because there is this this pre-flood and po post-flood history, and there are theological messages that can be conveyed uh, when you are, as a writer, when you are reacting to or responding to some other piece of literature, in this case, the Sumerian king list, that your readers, again, who are familiar with that, will know uh, better, maybe not completely, because in this case, again, the, the, the mathematical ciphering is, is still something of a mystery, even though if you read Bailey's article, there, there are a lot of patterns he detects that, that are, are, are pretty, pretty apparent, you know, once you, you follow what he's saying. But in, in some way, they would know that our 
the, the, the writer of the Torah here is responding and replying to, in some cases for theological reasons, to this other version of events. Okay, so in that sense, there is a relationship and there is a purpose. As far as did Enoch exist, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any reason to deny the existence of a person named Enoch before the flood event. Uh, again, I, that wouldn't really be any point of uniqueness in and of itself. There's nothing special. Uh, you know, if you have an Israelite writer who is writing about Enoch and he's number, number seven, number X in the list, any of these guys, there's nothing special about being the only you. So in, in, in this version, it, the name is Enoch. Now, you know, there, there could be, again, and people have argued for the, the idea that, well, both lists, even though they're composed at different times— both writers, even though they're, they, they, there's this gap, considerable gap of time between the two, both writers are thinking of the same individuals, the same King of Kish, for instance, the same this guy or that guy. Again, that, that's, that's quite possible, but it would still be that guy. It would still be a, a historical figure uh, in, in that instance. So what I'm trying to say here, here is the fact that there could be a mathematical cipher going on in Genesis 5 with these genealogies does not rule out that these were real kings or real people. And again, that, that God could interact with one of them, Enoch, and take him prematurely or give him some kind of special, you know, point of information. So I don't, I don't view those ideas as mutually exclusive. Now, as far as the question about the purpose of this and, and it, what, what, what the messaging might be. Now, since I've already said that I think the numbers in Genesis 5 are some sort of mathematical cipher, Again, there, there's there's some there there are specific conceptual and theological ideas that the writer is trying to convey through this technique. Since I embrace that idea, then yeah, I do think there is some sort of message. You know what it might be. People are still trying to figure out. Now, I'm here, here's a quote from uh, Bailey, the article I mentioned that I posted on my blog a short time ago. Bailey says this: It has often been pointed out that Enoch's lifespan of 365 years equals the number of days in the solar year. The connection between the two lies in the identity of his counterpart in the Sumerian king list. Uh, they're both in the seventh position. The name there is En Mendur Anna. Another text tells us that he, this again, Sumerian figure, was summoned to heaven to be instructed in the lore of the Baru priesthood in the Sumerian religion. His cult city, according to the king list, is Sippar, well known as a seat of solar worship. So there's a connection there. Further connection between the two persons, Enoch and En Mendor Anna, may be found at Genesis 5.24, where the former is likewise taken to heaven. Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. So again, there's, there's this relationship. And you say, well, why, why would the writer you know, of, of Genesis 5, what would be the point? Well, the point would be to deny that the Baru priesthood uh, of Sumeria, you know, had special knowledge from their god or gods. Uh, it, it, it would deny that, uh, you know, we should be worshiping the sun as the sort of progenitor uh, of, of the way the heavens work, the way the year works, the calendar year. It, it, it's Yahweh of Israel. You go back and read Genesis 1. It's, it's, you know, God, the God of Israel who created the sun, moon, stars for times and seasons and all this stuff. So there's, there's some theological jousting going on in that. But it's actually bigger than that. Let me, let me read you a, a selection. This is going to be a fairly lengthy selection from a book by Rachel Elior. It's E-L-I-O-R. And for those of you who, who have access to the Divine Council bibliography, this is not available in PDF. It's a book uh, that I couldn't find in PDF, but it's called The Three Temples. Okay. And it, it's basically uh, about astral religion in Israelite and Jewish, Jewish religion. Your biblical and intertestamental second period Jewish uh, thinking theology. So here's what she says. And it's, it's just follow along. It's really kind of fascinating. She writes here, and this is the beginning of chapter four uh, in that book. She writes, time as conceived by the authors of Qumran literature, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, in particular, the Temple Scroll, the, a text known as MMT, the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, the Damascus Document, the Blessings, the Psalm Scroll, the Calendars of the Priestly Discourses, and certain pseudepigraphic works, namely Jubilees and First and Second Enoch. The time was conceived by these people as something not arbitrary. It was not an arbitrary man-made structure or human order, dependent on unstable observations and determinations influenced by external conditions, adjustments, and errors. 
Time was of divine origin, a cosmic pattern obeying preordained, immutable laws, a cycle that had been recurring since sacred time was imprinted on nature during the seven days of creation and consecrated through the Sabbath day. Time was envisaged as the reflection of divine order in the universe, so designed as to perpetuate the cycle of life, blessing, and fertility, an order in which time and space are sanctified and interdependent from the earliest stages of creation, which took place in time divided into seven days and in the space formed during those seven days. The calendar, she continues, was not entrusted to man subject to adjustment and change, dependent upon human calculations or terrestrial considerations, for it represented the concept of a profound, comprehensive reality, a divine reality beyond the reach of the senses, but reflected in the cyclic numerical harmony revealed in the passage and changes of time. The calendar, based on a cycle of Sabbaths and seasons, embodied the eternity of the primeval order, based on the eternal cycle of the sun and the cyclic motion of the celestial bodies, which could be precisely predicted by numerical calculation. The calendar also related to the secrets of the cyclic nature of procreation, dependent again on counting and calculation. In other words, I'll, I'll just stop there. In other words, it refers broadly to nature. There's planting and harvest, ideas like that, but also you know, a certain reg fairly regular set of time for uh, conception and, and get childbirth, those sorts of things in both the human and animal kingdom. So again, back to Elior, the calendar also related to the secrets of the cyclic nature of procreation, dependent on counting and calculation, purification and oath, ensuring the continuity of abundance, life, and fertility. Any infringement of this sacred cyclic pattern as expressed in the fixed numerical proportions of its component parts. Any attempt to ignore the divine pattern based on number and counting would generate impurity, bringing in its wake curse, death, and oblivion. The calendar of weeks and seasons of Sabbaths and covenants with its eternal sight cyclic numerical pattern was taught to humans by divine angelic revelation. Now, if you've read the Book of Enoch, that's very explicit. Uh, again, how teaching humans how the celestial heavens work and time and calendars and all, this is laid at the feet of the watchers. And so she's, she's referring you know, to this second temple you know, material that discusses that. Now, with respect to Enoch, she writes, the aim of Enoch literature, again, so that's, again, either Genesis 5, a few verses there, and, and then the broader books of Enoch and Jubilees, that sort of thing. The aim of Enoch literature, whose hero described as Enoch, have you chosen from among the sons of Adam and called a righteous man, repeatedly transcended the boundaries of time and place. It was designed to link cosmic with the ritual cyclicity, to elucidate in detail the relationship between divine sevenfold structure of heavenly time, as reflected by sign and oath like Sabbath, sun, the number seven, son of righteousness, these sorts of, of phrases. Enoch, son of Jared, was, as already noted, the seventh in the list of generations from Adam to Noah. This is stated in the biblical record of Adam's line and in the list of patriarchs of the world in a prayer found at Qumran. Again, this is the same sort of thing. The, the length of his mortal life, 365 years, was exactly parallel to the number of days in the solar year, specified sometimes elsewhere as 364 and sometimes as 365 in the various calendar traditions. Now, what she's alluding to there is in some Dead Sea Scrolls, there is the number 365 for the calendar year, and there's the number 364. And it's, it's a, it's a long-standing academic debate as to why there's a difference in the numbers. Is there something being communicated there? And Elior has a footnote here. She says, the real solar year comprises 365 and a quarter days that a full cycle of the sun's apparent motion you know, covers that is well known. But the schematic year in the Qumran calendar consists of 364 days, which was 52 weeks, 52 sevens. Okay, the calculation comes out to 364. The number of days in the solar year was quite well known in antiquity. We learn from Egyptian literature and second Enoch, and the authors of Enoch and Jubilees were well aware of this discrepancy, 365 versus 364. We do not know how the priestly community actually coordinated the real and ritual numbers, but there's... Their cyclic calculations involve a calendar of 364 days and an additional day 
was included in the ritual count, which was perhaps added once in four years to compensate for the difference. So I'm going to stop there, but you get the idea that Jewish writers and theologians looked at Genesis 5, and again, they produced a lot of this other material in, in the stream of Second Temple Jewish tradition, books like Enoch. And it, it, that material tells you that they're looking, again, back at Enoch, and they're thinking, there's something up here with Enoch, with this 365. So to those people, there was a purpose, there was a message. And to those people, as Elior commented, they linked that number because he was the seventh from Adam. Seven is important, seven days, six days, and then the Sabbath, that's a week, okay? They linked that number and his age number at 365. Enoch became for them a both a symbol and a cipher and a figure through whom the truth about time and calendar and the movements of the heavens, the celestial objects, all the stuff associated with time and keeping time. Enoch became the central figure in understanding that and tracking it and mapping it and and looking at it, trying to discern meaning out of it. Because the belief was, and I've, I've commented on this before, the belief was that, you know, the God of Israel was the one that created this, this system. And when we observe the system, when we tap into it, not only are we trying to mimic it with our rituals on earth to observe it and and keep in sync with it through Sabbaths and festivals and seasons and all this stuff, not only are we trying to do that, but we believe, again, as, as Jews of the period did, we believe that God can be communicating certain things he's up to through celestial events. Okay, I've, I've talked about this before in relation to the birth of Jesus and all that sort of thing. So in, in that sense, again, this is what's going on, you know, with Enoch. So for in Enoch's case, the mathematical cipher would, you know, would was taken very clearly to relate to timekeeping and the way the heavens work. They're, they're doing what, what God made them to do. And when something unusual happens, or again, when, when we when we observe certain positions of certain things and we, you know, the ancients attach certain meaning to certain stars and certain positions and whatnot, that that telegraphs something to us. And of course, we're, you know, we're eons <laughs> removed, you know, from this way of thinking, but this is what was going through their head. So I just wanted to, to give an illustration of, of, you know, what some of that involves. And at, at the end of, of our episode today, when we talk about uh, what, some things Mike is working on. Uh, if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this back up because there is something I'm working on that relates to this specifically. But at this point, we'll just move on you know, to the next question. 